If you've been following some of the recent events going on in the world, you've probably seen things going around with the Ukraine and Russia and the tensions that have occurred in that country over the past couple of months and that have only been mounting since the beginning of 2022. Now, there have not really been any offensive operations in the cyber realm as of yet, really not physically either, but we have some historical events that occurred that we can look at to see what happened in those events, what was the impact on them, how widespread were they, and we can use those to somewhat predict on what may occur if there was an escalation in this conflict. Now, what we're specifically talking about today is the power grid cyber attacks, the Ukraine power grid cyber attacks that occurred in 2014 through 2016, specifically the ones in 15 that occurred that actually brought down the grid in a small area of the Ukraine. Welcome to the channel, everyone. My name is Seth with Seth on Security, where we talk about high level overviews or at least general somewhat overviews of potentially very technical subjects in the realm of physical and cybersecurity. If that's something you're really enjoying, please like the video, please subscribe, give me a comment, let me know what you'd like to see. So let's talk about the attacks and what happened and how it went down. So first, on December 23rd, 2015, there was a powder outage for approximately 230,000 consumers in the Ukraine. This occurred for one to six hours. So not a devastatingly long amount of time, right? The attack took place during an ongoing Russian military intervention in the Ukraine, which is you know, still occurring. It's attributed to the Russian APT group known as Sandworm. We'll talk about them a little later. This attack was the first publicly acknowledged successful cyber attack on a power grid. Now, that that's a really big deal. To have an attack on a power grid now we have seen things in the past like stuxnet which actually melted down reactors in nuclear power plants but we had not seen anything actually take control or shut down a actual electricity generation plant so these attacks occurred it was december 23rd so the security personnel were light because they were gone for christmas and the actual malware that was responsible for this was called black energy now black energy is a trojan and a trojan is something that is used it looks benign on the outside but then when you actually when it's actually run it's malicious just like the trojan horse right so black energy is a trojan and it was used to conduct ddos operations and cyber espionage and information destruction attacks now it actually dates back to around 2007 but in 2014, or approximately, there was a specific user of black energy attackers that began deploying these scatter related plugins to victims in the ICS or the industrial control systems and other energy markets. So what these plugins would do, and this is actually very common in a lot of malware today, where malware is very modular and it uses these plugins to have different functionalities. So for example, if a malware is deployed, it may just be a credential stealer, for example, but the attacker could deploy a ransomware module or plugin that could then turn it into a piece of ransomware. So it could become very destructive in a very short amount of time. And this also prevents the malware from potentially being detected by antiviruses right on the from the get go. So with this in mind and this specific plug-in for these industrial control systems, it showed that this was a pretty unique skill set and it was not just the average you know, DDoS botnet master. So originally from 2007, this piece of crimeware that was used, it was just for, you could say, basic theft and DDoS attacks or distributed denial of services, which is a distributed denial of service is a attack that essentially uses up a resource or denies access to a resource so that it basically can't be used. So it was designed actually initially to infect the Russian financial institutions and their websites and spread through a network and then exfiltrate financial information that would be used for fraudulent purposes. So you could think of selling data that is stolen and making a profit that way. 
back in the day, it had a dummy manual with it, and it could be purchased for around $40. We'll talk about how malware is purchased and the, the profitable business of malware in another video. Now, fast forward a, a few years, three to five, and this malware got a lot more sinister. So there was a plugin that was written called KillDisk, and KillDisk actually overwrites more than 4,000 file types with random data, and it damages the operating system, which makes it unbootable. So it basically bricks the entire computer. A year before this, Kaspersky identified more than 20 Linux and Windows plugins in Black Energy, including this KillDisk or Destroyer plugin. KillDisk has actually since evolved to its own malware. It's a standalone malware that is used by a variety of threat actors actually in, in Europe and Latin America. And it actually additionally has also developed a ransomware component that has been incorporated into some variants. So this plugin, because it was just a plugin for the Black Energy malware at the time, was used against the Ukrainian power companies and restricted their bootability. But it was also designed to sabotage their ICS software. So it targeted the Semubiquity, which was one of the services, and that was an ICS software that was used at the energy providers at the time. KillDisk would overwrite the data that would otherwise regulate and report on the machinery in place. The machinery would get shut down. So let's talk about how this happened. What was the cyber kill chain for this? The initial attack actually started with a compromise of the corporate network of the company that was the electrical company. And this was done through a spear phishing email. Now, if you don't know what a spear phishing email is, it's basically just an email that is very targeted and designed specifically for a person or a company so that it is more likely that that email will be interacted with, opened, and the threat actor will be able to socially engineer the victim. So these emails contained attachments and the attachments were not the typical or I should say, it wouldn't be very convincing if you were to send someone an executable file and say, you should open this. The best way to do it is, of course, with something like a Word doc or an Excel file that's much more friendly. So the threat actor would send an email and it would say, please review this, please open this in some way, please give me feedback on this file, right? And the victims, not realizing that this was actually an, an attack and also potentially understanding the urgency, which another reason to be suspicious of very urgent emails, right? Would open the attachment and the attachment would look something like this. And this attachment, what it's telling you, even if it's in Russian, get a uh, English one up. What it's telling you is that you need to enable the macros on this document in order to interact with it or see the data that they're putting up. This is a lie, of course. And never enable macros on a document that you are not familiar with because this is exactly how, and it still happens today, this is exactly how these infections start. Much less common on a person, personal level, as in sending to a personal email, much more, much more likely on a corporate network. Uh, so if any, there are any employees watching, very careful. Now, once the macro is enabled and the user enables the macro, that is when the actual payload is dropped be, because of a script that is run from the macro, drops the payload and the infection kicks off. So once that malware has been deployed, it seizes the SCADA and remotely switches off the substations. Then it spreads through a server message block and takes over additional computers. It disables the IT infrastructure components, so the uninterruptible power supplies, the UPSs, the networking infrastructure like modems and switches, and it destroys files that are stored on servers and workstations using the kill disk plugin. All really bad stuff, really, really bad stuff. On top of this, the attackers also performed a denial of service or a DDoS kind of attack on a call center so that it would deny consumers up-to-date information on the blackout. Crazy. So according to the Working Commission, and this is from a source at the Ukrainian government, 
The reasons for the unauthorized intervention were lack of general mandatory requirements for energy companies to ensure IT security of production automation systems, lack of awareness and training of technical staff on cybersecurity, lack of internal cybersecurity control structures independent of system administrators. Pretty, pretty fair analysis, I would say. This attack resulted in the loss of power for 200,000 Ukrainians for between one and six hours. That's a big problem. That could be a big problem, right? Sure, it was one to six hours, and that's not as bad, but imagine if it could be kept for three days or a month. Devastating, devastating consequences on a large scale. So let's talk about who was the trigger man. Who caused this attack, right? We know it was Russia. How can we figure out even more, a little deeper on who that was? And I mentioned at the beginning, it was attributed to the Sandworm APT. APT is Advanced Persistent Threat. In cybersecurity or in, in the security community, APTs are tracked as kind of like fugitives in a way, and they're given names. So this one was given Sandworm. The Sandworm APT is tracked as a Russian advanced persistent threat that, fun fact, was actually given the name Sandworm because there are references to the Dune science fiction series embedded in its malware, which is, I think, super cool. So a little history on the Sandworm APT and how really destructive and infamous they are. Actually, in October 2020, the U.S. indicted six Unit 74455 officers that were associated with Sandworm for these cyber operations. And there's a lot, not just the Ukrainian power grids. But here's the list. The 2015 and 2016 attacks against the Ukrainian electrical companies and government organizations. One. The 2017 worldwide NotPetya attack. Two. And we'll talk about that in a, in a later video. Targeting of the 2017 French presidential campaign, three. The 2018 Olympic destroyer attack against the Winter Olympic Games, four. The 2018 operation against the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, five. And, last one, attacks against the country of Georgia in 2018 and 19. So finally, I want to talk about a couple of questions that we may want to think about and potential future predictions when it comes to these offensive cyber operations with Sandworm and, and Russia together. The Sandworm APT has actually been called by some to be one of the most, if not the most, destructive cyber advanced persistent threats in the world. And with attacks like this, it's kind of easy to see why both of which have been very destructive to the Ukraine, very costly to the Ukraine. So with that in mind, how do we prevent these damages that could threaten people's lives? On a much higher scale, sure, the attack had only lasted, or the outage had only lasted for six hours at most. But in this case, how much worse could it have gotten? How, how bad could this get where we could have days or weeks without something like power or in the case we saw about a year ago now we had the colonial pipeline attack with a different attacker that threatened the actual entirety of the united states fuel supply so, well maybe not the entirety but at least a lot of the east coast and a lot of the airline systems that relied on this fuel were unable to get it for days with the pipeline being shut down so these escalations of these actual physical and destructive attacks, we haven't seen them yet, but how long might it be until we see something that is much more damaging? And what might that look like? I, I really hope we, we don't. <laughs> another thing in this theater in particular is how long until we see another destructive attack here in the Ukraine, especially if there's an escalation. I've got to believe that Russia has a plan for the escalation, including their cyber operations and what it may look like, hard to tell. And I have not found a lot of information that would lead to believe a certain kind of attack would occur. However, a power grid, that is a decent prediction because it's very destructive and very disruptional 
when it comes to operations and military operations and things like that. Fortunately, after these attacks, the Ukrainians actually put in some controls to prevent these kinds of incidents. Some of these controls were scanning of up-to-date and licensed antivirus software on all their computer tools. They have mandatory isolation from the internet for servers and workstations of industrial control systems, including stations from which the function of administration and maintenance of these systems are performed, replacement of all user accounts and setting of strong passwords, and they put a ban on remote access with the right to control the complex of telemechanics and others. That's a great start. And it's great that they've put in those controls, especially the isolation from the internet on servers and workstations of industrial control systems. That should definitely be a top priority and I'm glad that it has been. Note, however, that does not mean that they are off of a network entirely. They are simply not accessible from the internet. So if a threat actor were to infiltrate the network past whatever security controls they hopefully have from getting into their network, they could still pivot into those industrial control systems. It's also important to remember that the Ukraine used to be a part of Russia, and that certainly helps Russia when it was the USSR in their reconnaissance and information activity. And it makes an attack that much more likely, I think, in this case especially if there is an escalation of conflict. For now, we'll just have to see. But I hope this gives you a little bit of context on the cyber operations from Sandworm and Russia and the insight into what they may be thinking when it comes to cyber attacks in the Ukraine and their offensive operations coordinating with their military operations.